Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 248, featuring the fifth and final installment of my interview with the co-founder of Surtech, Mr. Robert Surotech. This part of the interview, we talk about Wizardry 8 and uh, Brenda Romero's involvement with that, what was going on with Douglas Bradley, and we also talk about Cleve Blakemore and the Stones of Arnhem Wizardry game that was never released. A lot of great stuff here, believe me, <laughs> you don't want to miss this one. So, uh, without further ado, here is Mr. Robert Surotech. All right, so let's move to Wizardry 8. Uh, now, this was, you know, I had Brenda on earlier, and she was talking about how she was, sort of took up the helm with this, and she didn't get to talk to David uh, Bradley about it. You know, I was wondering if you could just kind of uh, fill in the, you know, as much as you can or, <laughs> or willing to, the, the background of uh, what was going on with uh, Wizardry 8. All right, what specifically? Well, just, you know, why was... Uh, you know, what happened to, we sort of alluded, you already kind of mentioned that David didn't like the, the team sizes and that sort of thing, but, right. you know, so how did uh, Brenda end up in charge of it, I guess, and then uh, what, was it, is it true that she couldn't talk to, to David during the process? Well, firstly, she wasn't in charge. Uh, there was a collaborative effort in Wizardry 8. Uh, I, I, I was not working closely with Brenda at the time. I know that she was doing script work for the product. That was what she was supposed to be doing. I think her role evolved into doing some game design stuff as well. Um, but I'm not sure how or where and so on. Um, her her interaction with David at the time wasn't necessary because there was no connection to Wizardry 6 and 7 with number 8 other than continuing the storyline and bringing it to a tidy conclusion. You didn't need David for that. We were creating storyboarding and doing all kinds of other things that didn't really need David. By this time also, David uh, and, uh, and we had a falling out. Very regretful that it happened, but a lot of it had to do with uh, our disagreements with putting a company around David, and, and he chose not to pursue that. We knew it was going to be difficult to build product in that environment. Um, I'm going to raise something here. I'm not going to go too too deep into it um, because of a whole bunch of reasons, but uh, he was sued, and we defended him in that lawsuit. But ultimately when somebody does that to somebody, it creates tension in a relationship. And I think that contributed also to, to our relationship being under stress. Um, and so at the end of the day, with the industry going one way and with David going another way and with this threat, which we defended and brought to a conclusion that was over with, okay, and with tension now in our relationship, we just decided to park company. It was time to park company. Um, I don't think ill of David. I think he's a brilliant guy in not only computer coding, but also storyboarding, contenting, content like that. But he's a wonderful musician as well. And we had many, many wonderful days together, uh, hobnobbing, trying to figure out how to bring great product to this to this country. So I have no ill will for David at all. I'd love to say hello to him someday. But we went down different paths and Brenda was going down that different path and and in developing this product out of out of our Canadian office and and she did, you know. Does that answer that question? Sure. So you you, you do think that Brenda played a big role in the design of the game? No, she oh, she she, didn't. she did not. She she uh did some script working, script work. Wiz well, let me back up a bit. Wizardry 8, uh, we, we closed the company down after Wizardry 8 was launched to market. And that product, we went out with a bang with that product. That product is generally regarded very highly 
as a high point in in the bell curve of the of the products from from the low being return of Wardena to the high point being was three eight. Six and seven were very integral products to give us the stepping stones to get to number eight, the high point. So I don't diminish six and seven for a moment. They're beautiful, wonderful, wonderful products that David Bradley had produced. But Wizardry A was created on this high point as a collaborative effort among many different people. Brenda was one of four or five people that were very involved in the design of this product. Now, obviously, somebody had to take command and bring some form and function to it, but it wasn't that often when it was required. So it was a collaborative effort through lots of dialogue to decide collaboratively the direction of the product. And this is another one of these cases where there's a lot of content in this product. I had to step in and say, enough. We have 80 hours of gameplay when really all we should be doing is 60 hours of gameplay. So cut it off and bring things to a tidy conclusion. As the executive producer in that, I had that right. Uh, and Linda also was considered the project manager. Uh, Linda Curry was the project manager on this, uh, the producer. Okay, and uh, and so though technically on the organizational chart people were reporting to her, the atmosphere within the company was collaborative, and I think that was that that that's a testament to how we ran ran things. We really valued everybody's input, and when decisions had to be made, if there was no clear winner, no clear path, then one was made by the producer. And occasionally I came in and rattled the chains to bring things to a clue, you know, conclusion when, when necessary. That's definitely a great game. I just reviewed it not too long ago. Had a great time with it. Thank uh, you. Okay, so I have a question here from our... Let's see how to phrase this. Uh, <laughs> well, I have a question here from the RPG Codex. And they're yeah. asking about the canceled Wizardry Stones of Arnhem game and they reference i guess there's an ebay auction uh that took a look out where they found some i guess a box full of stuff really related to the game so you know again i just want to know what you're willing and able to share about this uh, stones of arnhem game all right you're gonna get a scoop on this one um this is baffling to me now it's a bit of a monologue but i gotta put it in context for everybody to understand this uh yep there was a game called Storms of Arnhem. It was being developed in Australia. Uh, we obviously, being in upstate New York, really didn't have a whole lot of interaction with these people in Australia, but we had somebody down there that was managing the thing. Somebody we trusted, somebody who was very capable. Well, he was running this show, and um, these guys, you know, the culture... And the history and the offbeat nature of some of the things that go on in Australia is just a wonderful place to create stuff. Look at the Mad Max series that was produced in Australia. Some of the Village Roadstow stuff that they got done is all in Australia. This whole legendary stuff like uh, uh, with the Aboriginal people that you see in Crocodile Dundee. I mean, this is all rich content stuff with the right kind of humor to create some really wonderful product. And that's why we did it down there. Well, that's why we wanted to, to explore this as a possible way of coming up with something unique. So we hired all the guys. We spent a fortune down there, a lot of money trying to get this thing produced. At the end of the day, we were losing our patience because there was a whole lot of graphical work, but no... Um, uh, software algorithms and systems architecture for the game itself. So we were very close to close, closing this whole thing down, and just that, that this was the only only video game that we ever canceled in the history of our company. Sad but true. Everybody has them. So we were so close to killing it when our man in charge down there came forward and said, "I think I found a crackerjack coder." 
uh, why don't we give them a chance so that we don't close this thing down and lose a fortune in this um, debauchery? And we said, eh, okay, why not? But it was under the pretense that this guy accept this assignment that we're very close to our patients wearing out and we're close to killing this thing. And if he hadn't stepped forward, we would have killed it. So we're in no frame of mind to be paying people huge salaries. If you want to save this thing, then save it. A lot of the, the, the producer down there received a plea from the, from the programming base and the other workers saying, look, don't kill this thing. I think we can salvage this. Here's a crackerjack coder. We, you know, that's, it, in other words, it was it, the suggestion not to kill the project came from the developers, not from the manager down there, not from us. So that's why we said, okay, let's continue it. But on the basis, we're not going to be paying these stupidly high salaries or whatever they were at the time, they may not think of them as stupidly high. And I'm not trying to say they were, but we, we had enough of paying and paying and paying and seeing nothing. So if they want to build it, go for it. You've got X amount of time to build it. And at that point, we're going to stop the salaries as meager as you may think as they think they are, but that's, you know, we've got to end it at some point. So we merrily went along and CES came up, and it was in Chicago this time. He flew up the Cracker Jack programmer to help us present the product. He did. We then flew to our offices in upstate New York, had a series of meetings with this Cracker Jack programmer, who is an American military guy. And um, we just had some very frank conversations. And, and he was offering us information about things that aren't going very well. Uh, and at the end of the day, we basically said, we're going to close this thing down. I'm sorry, but, you know, we're just not getting anywhere. And you're, the problems are too complex for you alone to solve. We see this as a loser. And it's no reflection on you. But we told you when you started that we were on a thin rope. So we killed it. And I don't know what, what knocked this guy's nose out of joint. We were just being businessmen who had had enough of a project that was going on for an eternity, going nowhere for an eternity. We killed it. And this guy's nose got knocked out of joint. We started spewing all kinds of trash on this forum that you're talking about. Uh, I am incensed by it. They've trashed my reputation that I spent 25 years building. I think it was uncalled for. It's unprofessional. And I'm going to leave it at that because, frankly, I don't want to create any more fuel to the flames. But um, that's the backstory on it. And um, uh, he tried to produce his own products after that. And I think he's got the record now for the longest vaporware in the history of the video game industry. So I think my point was proven at the end of the day that, you know, at some point you just got to stop with the all talk and no action routine. So that gives you some history on Stones of Arnhem. And by the way, it was not really cast as the next wizardry. We said that it would be a possibility to help to have the wizardry name if the quality was good enough, if it was a worthy successor to Crusaders of the Dark Savant, Wizardry 7. And it proved that it wasn't able to meet that. Building video games is an incredibly hard thing to do, and they failed. It's as simple as that. There was also all kinds of artwork being produced. Uh, that we were on that, that we had no uh, knowledge of, and when we closed the project down, we asked all of the contents to be put, like all of the artwork and the the code, everything that was produced, all the intellectual property, to be put in a box and shipped to us. When it arrived, 
We put it in our in a storage lock storage area, and ultimately, some of this stuff ended up on the internet uh, when the storage locker people improperly conveyed it to the eBay vendor, and um, and he started selling some of this artwork and other things um, on the internet. You've all heard of storage wars. Well, you know, <laughs> this is not something that was around when we closed this project down, when was it? In the early 90s or something? Maybe it was the mid-90s. And we put it in as a storage locker, and it sat there for like five, ten, five years or something. And then all of a sudden, unbeknown to us, this whole, there, there's this whole mini business by opening old storage lockers and taking the contents of storage lockers and selling the people who then flogged this stuff to make money. I mean, that's what happened. But it was improperly conveyed, so we put an end to that. And uh, and some of the graphics uh, artwork that was being, you know, line drawings and things like that that were being produced in Australia, we had no knowledge of any of that. We're in upstate New York. This is being done down in Australia. But it was lewd and crude and completely not what our company was all about. So, you know, the mindset that was going on was so has what has proven to me so far off where our our corporate culture was and what we stood for as a company at the end of the day I'm glad I closed it down so that's the backstory on that one that's not been said anywhere because it's not something that I'm too terribly proud about but it's unfortunate and, you know you, you take these things and you deal with it well, thank you, uh, Robert, for sharing that. I know it was, must have been painful. Uh, so, a couple last questions here. Uh, one thing I'm wondering how you got involved with the uh, Loot Drop company. Well, um, that's a company that was started by Brenda uh, Romero, as she's now known, um, formerly Brenda Brathwaite and John Romero. Uh, as I said, Brenda and I had a very strong relationship while she was with us. She, she was with us for 20 years. Is that possible? I don't know, something like that, a long time. And, she, is, uh, uh, she said she's the longest serving woman in the games industry. Well, she probably is. I don't know. Um, but uh, I don't keep track of those stats, but uh, you know who knows? Probably she's been at it for a long time. Anyway, uh, she started with us when she was 15 years old. I don't want to date her, but anyway, it's you know she's not a 15 year old anymore. <laughs> so anyway, Brenda called me and said, "Look, we want to start this company to produce uh, products for Facebook for the Facebook platform." I wasn't doing a whole lot at the time. I said, oh, interesting. And I chewed the, chewed the fat with her over this and John. And at the end of the day, we decided to start it. Uh, I left it early. I was only there for about three or four months. Um, I left it primarily because these guys wanted to take it in a direction that I had a hard time dealing with. And also, I was on the East Coast. They were on the West Coast. It would have meant... Uh, picking up household and moving it all there. And, and I've got, um, uh, and I was ready to do that, but, uh, it, you know, after four or five months, there wasn't a whole lot of time that passed that enabled me to do that. And, and, and so we just decided that it was better to part company and we did. So what are your future plans? Are you done with the games industry or are you thinking about making a comeback? Well, uh, we'll see. Uh, I'm kicking a few tires around right now. There are some possibilities. Uh, some people have approached me to uh, take advantage of the current popularity of PC games. It's now, as you know, out outstripped uh, console sales, like console software sales. Really? Yeah, yeah. Recently, I, uh, uh, that that was a stat that uh, that thanks that to Steam and. Uh, I don't know. There's a resurgence of PC games, according to uh, what's the name of the company that put it out? PCR? No. DFC Intelligence. That's the name of the company. They're basically a research company that uh, 
keeps track of sales and what's going on out there. PC games have now outstripped uh, uh, console sales, uh, console software sales. And I'm not surprised to hear that. Uh, we are between consoles right now, as you know. Maybe things will change when uh, all this other stuff gets launched. Uh, but at any rate, I'm looking at it. And I would be, again, messing with PC product, possibly also console product in time. Um, we do own the intellectual property rights to Wistry 1 through 5. Maybe we'll do something. I like where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could, uh, we could do something. I don't know uh, yet. No, there, are no, there have been no decisions being made, made on this, and it may not be possible to do it at the end of the day. Um, but if we do something, we would do it with, with the right players, and uh, those are variables that I don't know that I have right now. So, you I know, mean, this is very speculative. But I will never say never to anything. You know, the video game industry is in my blood. When I was in the industry, it was the happiest time of my life. I really, truly enjoyed it. It was such a pleasure bringing good quality entertainment to such a huge fan base from all over the world. And um, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot of it's going to take a lot of variables to be just right to get me back into it because I don't want to do something. Uh, if it won't be successful, obviously. So um, I'm looking at it. There are a couple of proposals out there that look interesting. We'll see. And if nothing materializes, oh, well. We'll see what happens in the future. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Well, Robert, thanks so much. This has been awesome. A really great interview. I'm just wondering, do you have other issues that you would like to discuss, things I didn't ask about? Um, probably, I mean, I, there's all, I don't, nothing comes to mind. Uh, I, we could talk about the current industry players. There are some people out there that are really just terrific people that, you know, the Will Wrights of the world, the Richard Garriott's of the world, the Brian Fargo's of the world, the Paul Newrass of the world. These guys have been around forever. They're still in the industry. They're still producing great products. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we can see more, more airplay with them. I'd love to hear what's on their mind. You've already done some stuff with uh, with Richard. I've seen those. Uh, but there, there are some other players that have been around for a long time that still that are still out there that I'd love to hear from. So. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to people at large. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, fans out there, for giving me the opportunity to, to produce great products for you all those decades. It's been a true privilege. And, uh, and we'll see whether or not I get back into it. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a new retrospective and I'm probably uh, more than likely going to be looking at uh, the Mount and Blade game. So uh, stay tuned for that. And also let me know if you have any, any thoughts on that series. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much, guys. If you have supported this show, you know, it really means a lot to me. And I think it's important to uh, interview people like Robert Sirotek and hear these stories that, you know, really honestly, where are you going to hear those anyplace else? So uh, thank you very much, guys. If you'd like to support the show yourself, if you haven't done so, uh, just look for the link in the show notes to the Patreon site. Sign up for that in a couple of minutes. You can uh, support the show at any level you want, a dollar a week, $10 a week, whatever. Uh, it all means a lot to me. Really appreciate it, guys. So uh, thanks again. News from the Mad Cave. Oh man, I've got a lot of news items here today, a lot of exciting stuff going on. Uh, Philippe uh, Pepe uh, wrote in to talk about this crowdsourced book he's doing about role playing games. Uh, basically, he's looking for people, volunteers, to write articles and reviews about their favorite uh, role playing games. I'll put a link to the project uh, if you'd like to get in on that. And then uh, uh, Thamer uh, wrote in uh, talking about a game called Sheltered, a strategy survival game. 
And this was a, a kickstarted project and uh, happily it was su uh, successful. I think they actually went uh, double their uh, initial goal, so that's really cool. Um, and let's see, Shane Stacks wrote in about a, a new Underworld, new Ultima Underworld game. Paul Newrath is, is a, of Looking Glass is actually involved in this. Uh, so that's really exciting news. And you know, it reminds me, it's kind of long overdue for that Ultima Underworld uh, retrospective. But if you haven't played that series, you really should check it out. All right, then we have, uh, let's see, oh, I got a package from uh, Ben. I'm going to sh show you this here. Incredible, uh, you know, what can you say? I mean, this is like Christmas come early, Christmas in July with this thing. Uh, Gold Box Games, uh, Eye of the Beholder, and lots of these uh, choose your own adventure style books that, you know, I hadn't, e I hadn't even uh, encountered these until a couple years ago. So, uh, really fun, really looking uh, forward to digging into this. And, you know, thank you very much, Ben. I mean, this is just awesome. Uh, thank you. All right, what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I've got a Dark Horse, one of my favorite breweries. They're out of uh, Marshall, Wisconsin. If you ever get a chance to try their stuff, uh, you know, you can't go wrong with this, with this uh, brewery. Uh, this one is called Smells Like a Safety Meeting, India Pale Ale, and it's got a really fun uh, label on it, these noses <laughs> with feet and arms running around like they're <laughs> running for something. I'm not really sure what the connection is, but you know, that's dark horse for you. I get the impression sometimes they sample their <laughs> copious amounts of their own product. 8.5% uh, alcohol, but I was looking on here, I don't see anything else on the bottle about the, about the beer. So anyway, uh, let's just get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this smells like a safety meeting here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I, I've been trying to decide uh, if it does in fact smell like a safety meeting, and for that matter, what the hell does a safety meeting smell like? But I guess uh, it'd be a pretty awesome safety meeting if it did smell like this, because this smells very much like beer. This is sort of very a uh, hoppy aroma to it. Not a real overpowering uh, aroma or anything, but you definitely smell the hops here. I can tell this would probably be pretty uh, bitter. Probably going to be on the bitter side, but uh, we'll see. Mm. That's quite tasty. Uh, it's nice, thick, uh, creamy uh, consistency there. You get a lot of the bitterness, as I expected. A little bit of a nutty-like flavor. A pretty strong dose of cherry uh, in there as well. Maybe a bit of a, a smoky. Yeah, that's, you know, say sort of smoky, cherry, and a little bit of a nutty flavor is what really is standing out here. Of course, you taste the hops, and it is quite bitter. Uh, let me try it again. It's quite good. Uh, it would not, it's not for everybody. <laughs> you know, I'll say this. It is. It does ca uh, pack quite a punch uh, with that 8.5% alcohol, and you definitely have a lot of bitterness to deal with there. But if you like that sort of thing, and I do occasionally, just like a, a you know a bitter ale. So I'm gonna go. Uh, I guess I'll go maybe four out of five drinking horns on this. It's sort of you know sort of somewhere between three and four, but I'll go ahead and give it the four. Uh, smells like a safety meeting. I have no idea why they called it that, but it is uh, quite tasty if you like India pale ales. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was uh, I found I was looking for stuff about anger, and I found a funny one from Mark Twain. You know he's always good for a quote, and uh, it goes something like this: When you're angry, count to four. When you're very angry. Swear. <laughs> I'll see you guys next week. Uh, greetings, adventurers. Greetings. As you all can see here, we have a new traveler in our ranks. Uh, this is my cousin Tyrell, and he will be controlling the player character. His name is Kanye. Mm -hmm. He's a giant, yo. Oh. 